With one of the best savings rates in America, banking with Capital One is the easiest decision in the history of decisions. Even easier than choosing Slash to be in your band. Next up for lead guitar. You're in. Cool. <laughs> yep, even easier than that. And with no fees or minimums on checking and savings accounts, is it even a decision? That's banking reimagined. What's in your wallet? Terms apply. See CapitalOne.com slash bank for details. Capital One and a member FDIC. Hey, it's Mistress Carrie reporting for duty from MCHQ for episode 101 of the Mistress Carrie podcast. This episode of the podcast is sponsored by Boldfoot Socks. Now, you know, here on the Mistress Carrie podcast, we are always supportive of our military and veterans. And while Boldfoot Socks are 100% American made, they also donate 5% of all of the proceeds to veterans charities. Boldfoot Socks is family and veteran owned. And if you go to boldfoot.com, you can check out all of their socks. And there are a ton. You can join the Sock of the Month Club, check out their bestsellers. They've got patriotic socks and striped socks, gift packs, polka dots, solids, argyle, chevron. And they come with three months of free sock insurance. You heard me right. If your socks rip, tear, or develop holes, they'll replace them, no questions asked. But don't take my word for it. Just log on to boldfoot.com and see for yourself. Boldfoot Socks, a proud sponsor of the Mistress Carrie podcast. And before we get to this week's guest, Geezer Butler from Black Sabbath, I want to remind you that the Facebook podcast interface is going away in the next couple of weeks. That podcast interface is what puts my episodes right on your Facebook timeline when you're using the mobile app. And so if that's how you normally listen to the Mistress Carrie podcast, please go and subscribe to my podcast wherever else you would listen to podcasts. Apple, Google, Spotify, Pandora, iHeart, Odyssey, basically anywhere you can find a podcast, you can just search for the Mistress Carrie podcast and subscribe and follow. And you can always go to mistresscarry.com to find every episode of the podcast, every situation report, and every episode of Cocktails in the War Room. Well, this week is another rock and roll legend on the podcast. Another inductee into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, Geezer Butler got inducted into the Rock Hall as part of Black Sabbath back in 2006 by members of Metallica. Most recently, Geezer Butler is appearing on the new single from Apocalyptica called I'll Get Through It. He's also working on his autobiography, a line of NFTs. He's managing all of his house pets, and there are many that you'll hear about in this episode. Trying to unpack from a move, preparing to go on a trip, and all while digging through his archives trying to put a box set of his solo material together. Geezer Butler is a busy guy. And he sat down with me to talk about all of that and so much more. And by the end of this episode, you'll know exactly why I have become Geezer Butler's official house sitter. So allow me to introduce you to the one and only, the legend, Geezer Butler from Black Sabbath. Hey, what's up? This is Sully from Godsmack. Strap on those boots, baby, because you are now in the trenches of the war room with the one and only Mistress Carrie right here on the Mistress Carrie podcast. What's up? This is Joe Rogan, and you're listening to Mistress Carrie. I have so lovely pretty eyes. Hey, this is Brent from Shinedown, and you're listening to Mistress Carrie. Hey, Carrie, go put your brow on, girl. Hey, this is Steven Tyler, and you'll be listening to the baddest bitch in Boston, Mistress Carrie. What's up? This is Aaron from Stan. And you're listening to Mistress Carrie. Hi, everybody. This is Dave Grohl from the Food Fighters, and you're listening to the one, the only, Mistress Carrie. Hey, this is David from the band Disturbed, and you're listening to the baddest bitch in Boston, Mistress Carrie. Hi, Bruce Dickinson here from Iron Maiden. Yes, indeed. Miss Whiplash herself, Mrs. Carrie, is here to um, unchain your brain. Hi, this is Flea from the Red Hot Chili Peppers, and you're listening to Mistress Carrie. This is Dennis Leary. You are listening to my favorite, Mistress Carrie. Hey, this is Corey from Stone Sour, and you're listening to. You have the privilege of listening to Mr. Scary. Oh, God. Oh, yeah. Mr. Butler, thank you for joining me. 
Oh, you're welcome. How are you? Very good. You, I think, are one of the busiest guys in rock and roll right now. I feel like every time I turn around, you're working on a new project or something. Um, yeah, and we've, we've been moving for the last six months, so I'm still unpacking all kinds of stuff. Moving is the worst. What have you found in the boxes that you couldn't uh-huh. believe you still had? Look, it's the stuff that I can't find. <laughs> I've got four left shoes and I can't find the right ones. <laughs> yeah, you've probably lost cooler things than I've found, I would think. <laughs> Well, let's start with this long punch list of things you got going on. The first thing is this song with Apocalyptico, I'll Get Through It. Um, Is is Apocalyptico the craziest idea for a rock band you've ever heard? Um, It's very unusual, I must admit. But uh, I think they're doing really, I think they do it really well. It's such a crazy idea on paper, but when you go and see them live, it all makes sense. Yeah, they're great. I mean, I haven't seen them live, but um, yeah, I've saw, you know I've seen the videos of them. It's really clever the way they do stuff. And this song was written by Diane Warren, who you know may have written a great song or two here or there in her career. Yeah, only a few. <laughs> As a songwriter yourself, um, how is it working with a songwriter like Diane Warren, but on a project that? she's not really a part of just get handing just getting handed a song well it was really weird because um because diane's one of uh, my wife's uh closest friends and um i went down just to see she invited me to go and see a studio in la and um i was looking around the studio which is amazing and uh she just heard uh, some deadland ritual stuff that i'd done and I says, oh, have you got anything that would fit with this, with the stuff that we're doing? She, and she played uh, I'll Get Through It. And I was with Frankie Perez at the time. And he absolutely loved the song. And immediately he put vocals to it. And um, Diane loved it, what he did. And we went from there. The collaboration is kind of, coming from all corners of music but when you hear the song when you see the video which by the way were you guys all in the same room or no because of COVID making that video no it was all done uh, separately they did a good job because it looked like you guys were all together yeah and it's really quick as well I mean literally it was the fastest video I've ever done in my life (laughs) I went went in went through it about uh, I think three times and that was it the guy says, okay, that's it. You can go now. He's like, what? And it was, it was done that fast. Do you have any plans to actually do the song live with Apocalyptica? No, nah, no plans, no. Nah. Just collaborating on music together? Yeah, it was just because um, Frankie loved the song and Frankie's worked before with Apocalyptica and they heard uh, Frankie singing it and they loved it and... Um, Frankie says, well, geez, we'll come along and play bass if you, if you like. And I really uh, wanted to do that. And that's the way it came about. Real, quite painless, really. I spent a lot of years on the air at WAF in Boston, a legendary rock station. And when it went off the air after 50 years, we had to pick the song that was going to be the last song we ever played. And we spent a lot of time going back and forth about it. And we decided that the last song, because you were celebrating your 50th anniversary yourself, that we should, at midnight, go off the air with Black Sabbath, Black Sabbath. And so now, every time I hear that song, I think of us signing off a legacy rock station. Yeah, that's good. It's a great way to finish it. A lot of people credit that album and Black Sabbath with inventing heavy metal. Do you think that's true? Um, I, I don't really see it myself. Um, we never put ourselves into uh, any sort of category. That's why the al- albums, of uh, particularly of the original version of Sabbath, that's why we were so uh, diverse in, so, in the songs that we did. Um, I mean, the first three albums were really 
I suppose, heavy. I think Master of Re- Reality was probably the heaviest album we'd done. And But we wanted to expand, at volume four onwards, we wanted to uh, branch out and expand our musical ideas. <clears throat> so <clears throat> and it wasn't until later that uh, we were categorised as heavy metal. And at first, it was a derogatory thing. By we read this, um, some guy did a, a review of our concert, and he said, "This isn't music. It just sounds like a load of heavy metal being crashed together," and um, which was derogatory at the time. And somehow that went to England, and um, it went from there. They started classing us as heavy metal. When you think about rock and roll, hard rock, heavy metal, and the legendary bass players that have come out of the genre, a lot of them credit you with being their inspiration. Everyone from Les Claypool, Cliff Burton, Jason Newstead. I talked to a lot of guitar players about their tone and where they think it comes from. How would you answer that question? Um, I literally just used to plug in. I never used any effects or anything like that. Um, on the first three albums, I'd just go in there and apart from using a wild, wild pedal on NIB, for instance, on the first two or three albums, I just used to plug in and play. Didn't really think much about it. Just played it, played it as if I was doing a live gig. You've written some of the most iconic hard rock and heavy metal, not a derogatory term, songs. As a songwriter, I love, I'm, I'm, I'm so envious of the craft because I can't do it myself. I've tried and failed miserably. Can you give me an example of a song that you think is a perfect example of songwriting? A song you, you covet and that you wish you wrote yourself? What, of somebody else's songs? Yeah. But from mm. a songwriting perspective, not just a, I really love that song kind of thing. Um, well, any of the Beatles stuff. Uh, I mean, that's what I used to love about the Beatles because you'd never get one song the same as another one. It was never, um, they didn't class, I mean, it was all pop music, but uh, they used to just experiment on each album. No no two albums were the same. So um, I love that kind of songwriting where you don't keep repeating yourself. That recent documentary giving us kind of a a bird's eye view of the writing process really kind of showed the brilliance of how they were able to craft a song. It was it was crazy being able to see it. Yeah, it's a, I, I couldn't believe that some of the stuff McCartney wrote on bass. Um, I think it was Larry. No, it wasn't Larry. But it was one of the songs, and he did all the chords on bass. Yeah, it was. Really- it was crazy because you know how the song ends up. So you're just kind of sitting there waiting for him to get to that point where. <laughs> yeah. When he's think, trying to think of the next line, you're going, well, it's, you know, wherever the line is and you're trying to tell him. Through the two <laughs> <people."> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, is that you think your biggest influence? I, I know that growing up, you guys were all, I mean, how could you not be influenced by the Beatles? Oh, without a doubt. I mean, from every perspective, because, uh, the music on the radio in England was horrible before <laughs> the Beatles. I mean, it was just like, um, I mean, my brothers were into Elvis and that kind of stuff, but it wasn't really, I didn't really get into that kind of thing. But, uh, and that was from pirate radio stations. You'd hear like Elvis and stuff like that. On normal BBC, it was all this awful, bloody middle of the road crap that, um, it used to be really depressing. And then one night I heard a song called Love Me Do and I thought, what, what on earth is this? And I kept listening to the radio every night for Love Me Do to come on by the Beatles. And um, when I, the more popular that they got, I found out that the, the spoken um, like working class accents like us and they were the first, they were the first band when you heard them speaking in an interview that didn't try to sound American or try to sound posh. And that that was a massive influence on me. I look at rock and roll like a ping pong ball that keeps getting shot across the Atlantic Ocean. 
And that things yep. in the United States inspire these amazing British artists and then it comes back again? Of course. I mean, the American blues started the whole uh, heavy rock thing and blues and soul. Um, if it wasn't for the blues stuff, there wouldn't have been Cream or Hendrix or any, anybody like that. And that's what we used to listen to. Uh, a lot of the Beatles stuff is from... Uh, original uh, American soul artists and the whole thing started from America not the, not so much uh, the rock and roll like Elvis but more like the blues and uh, soul what are some of the artists that are newer that you've been listening to that you think are carrying that tradition on what metal or soul yeah either or both um I've just Heard a lot of good soul stuff, modern soul stuff. I can't really think of the names. I just listen to it and put it on my playlist. As far as uh, rock goes, I like Mastodon. I always listen to them. Um, I went to see uh, Tool. I thought that was a great concert. Um, various things. If you didn't hear the Beatles back in the day, what do you think... What do you think your life would be like now if you weren't a musician? What what would you be doing for work? I'd have long been dead. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. It was really depressing where, where I was born. Um I don't know. I mean, the last the last job I tried to get, because I was fully qualified uh, for accountancy, and that's where I studied for three years, being an accountant. But I could never turn up at work on time. <laughs> And um, I hated going to work, so I started getting drunk and taking pills and everything just to get me through the work day. And uh, eventually I started coming in like at 4 o'clock in the afternoon <laughs> and the, uh, the managing director called me into his office and said, you're fired. <laughs> so, um, and because I had long hair and everything, I couldn't get another job in those days. They used to look at me for office jobs you had to have short hair. So uh, the very final thing I went for was to wash cars. And, uh, and the guy says, I turned up at this car wash place, and the guy said, how old are you? I said, 18. He said, this, this is a job for retired people. You have to be like, you know, the people that we're looking for, like over 65, you're way too qualified to be washing cars. And... Um, and that was it. I never went to another job interview ever again. I just got more and more into playing my guitar and I was just determined to make it as a musician. I mean, of course, everybody thought that was pie in the sky. Um, but, you know, I just stuck at it. Well, the accounting background, I'm sure, has come in handy over the years. It was originally when I used to go and get the, uh, the money at the end of the night for the, when Sabbath used to play to get out. $20 or whatever it was. And then when we got management taken over, they just took all the money off us anyway. <laughs> that story has been told a million times in rock and yeah. roll, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. Especially in England. I mean, the, the English bands had the worst managers of all time. I mean, the Stones went through it. Kinks went through it. Everybody I know. From now, from the 60s and early 70s, were totally ripped off. You're going through a lot of these older stories because you uh, talked recently about handing in the first draft of your autobiography. How, yes, at last. How painful was that process for you? How daunting to sit down and write your life story? Well, he couldn't really relax because he turn on the t he'd write for a, a few hours and then you, you know, you want to do take the dog for a walk and stuff. And you'd be thinking, well, I should be still writing my book instead of watching the TV or going out for a meal or something. So it was just stuck in my head 24 hours a day. And I'd go to bed and think, Oh, I should have put that in it. And, um, after 12 months, it was such a relief to finally send the, the draft in to uh, the publishers um, it's just such a total relief. Now I can like get on with my life. Were there stories that you got from other people that you didn't remember yourself, but other people oh, telling yeah. you that it happened? 
Yeah, well, uh, there's it's sort of uh, I don't know whether you call it a ghostwriter or, or what. It was like this this guy in uh, in England that was uh, doing the sort of ghostwriting part. It wasn't really a ghostwriter because I wrote the whole book myself, and it was like. 1973 onwards, I couldn't remember a bloody thing. <laughs> so he did all the research, you know, you'd say, well, what did you, this, what happened at this gig and where, what happened with like the California jam, how did that come about, that kind of thing. And, um, you know, I used to rack my brains what I used to do. And it's true, as soon as we started co- taking cocaine, <laughs> I can't remember anything after that. <laughs> So this this guy in England, he went through all the archives, uh, all the books that have been written about us and everything, and he wanted to put my perspective on it. And a lot of the stuff I couldn't even remember, but um, some of the stuff he, he he sort of brought the memories back. Well, you know, I could put my angle on it. You were asking on social media to help name the book. Have you settled on a title yet? Nah, it's another thing I keep thinking. It's like somebody sent me two more titles in. It's like that sound good, but it, it's really hard to decide which one. Is it coming out this year? Do you know yet? Well, I've yet to get the, the editor goes in um, Thursday. He'll be do, he or she will be editing what I've sent in, and then. It goes from there. I think they're looking to get it out towards the end of this year, yeah. I would imagine that that process is kind of like working with a music producer, that you spend all this time crafting this thing, this this baby that you hand off to someone else, and then they have the gall to criticize it. Well, not only that. I mean, the guy in England that I've been working with, he sent me, like, his version of uh, some of the stuff that I wrote, and it was a lot of crap. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's literally you have to do the whole thing yourself. You can't have ghostwriters or anything except to remind you of what happened when and where. So um, God knows what the editor will come back with. And ever and plus, since I uh, handed in the manuscript two weeks ago, I've already thought like six or seven different things that I should have put in the book. <laughs> it, goes, it goes on forever. You also are working on this box set of all of your solo material. Can you tell me kind of some of the things you uncovered working on that process? Um, not a lot. I mean, I, the, the, at the last minute, they asked me if I had anything that was never released. And it's like, oh, God, especially moving and everything. There's stuff all over the place, stuff in England, stuff in L.A., stuff in Utah, every. Stuff everywhere, so I didn't really have anything uh, at hand to. Um, so I just put some stuff that was on cassette that sounds terrible. <laughs> Does it for, su- the ex- for the extras? But I didn't want to do extras anyway. But uh, they insisted on it, so I was just all I wanted was to, uh, to have the um, the GZR Giz albums out on vinyl and. Uh, they really liked the idea, and it went from there. Then they the, talked about doing the CD box set. Um, went from there. Does it surprise you, the resurgence of vinyl? Are you a vinyl guy yourself? Um, I've still got stuff from the 60s. I don't really uh, – no, I don't really play much of it. I used to be a vinyl guy, obviously, before uh, CDs and everything, but um, no, it's just so much easier to just download stuff. <laughs> But music fans now are buying up vinyl like crazy. Oh, yeah. And uh, my son, who lives in London, said the big thing in England now is cassettes. I heard that that was coming back, which I personally do not understand. And I think if you're going to be an artist that releases music on cassette, you should have to release a pencil with it with your band logo on it. (laughs) To yeah. help to help solve the problem that you're eventually going to have that you just don't know about it because you weren't alive the first time. <laughs> it's just a fad, I think. I think it's you know cassettes and probably the, the worst, apart from eight tracks, they were the worst things you could possibly <laughs> have. <laughs> 
Well, I want to talk to you about this. Trend, trendy things, especially in London, where everybody's really trendy, man. Um, you know, it's, oh, have you, I've got this on cassette. <laughs> I have a bunch of cassettes now. I don't know what to do with them. Good luck finding a cassette player. No, I've still got loads of eight tracks. <laughs> <laughs> um, speaking of technology, you're also working on this graphic novel and releasing it as a series of NFTs. Can you, Geezer Butler, please explain to me what the frig an NFT actually is? I thought you'd explain it to me. <laughs> I think my wife, Gloria, can explain it a lot better than I can. Um, I just did it because I like the, the artwork uh, of Carl, a guy in, um, in England, sent me this thing. It was originally this monster turning loose, and it was originally on my soccer club in England, Aston Villa, um, and I liked that. And then this whole NFT thing came up, and... It was mainly to showcase his artwork because I really like his artwork. So um, I wrote a, a story to his artwork and come out with some base stuff for it, uh, for the music thing. Um, and I think it went live about two weeks ago. Well, I haven't heard anything about it since. And it's raising money for charity, correct? Yeah, it's for um, Ukraine, uh, mainly for the animals in Ukraine. Well, you've always been an animal activist, even getting involved with kitten rescue, which Rob Halford is involved with. Who knew there were so many heavy metal kitten lovers? Oh, yes, we love them. We love the cats was and it, the dogs. Was it, uh, was it something that helped to keep you sane during all of the time off at home with COVID, was having the animals around? Well, yeah. I mean, I grew up, my best friend when I was growing up was my dog. Um, my parents bought me the, this dog for my seventh birthday and he really was my best friend. I used to play soccer with him outside. Um, he was taken for a walk and everything like that. He was brilliant. He was, and, um, when he died, my parents couldn't even tell me that he died. And, uh, I came home one night and I asked where he was and they said he's out in the outside in the yard and I went out and there was a, a grave and he died and they buried him and I lay on his grave for probably a, an hour crying and you know and ever since that I've, I've loved animals what are your animals names now <laughs> I'm all, I have a dog named Wednesday so I feel like when you name an animal it's it's a huge responsibility it says something about them well, it's a bit easier for us because we name all our animals after rappers. You do? Yeah. So we've got Missy after Missy Elliott, Dizzy after Dizzy Rascal, um, Coco after Coco Brown. Uh, who else is that? Biggie. This is the <laughs> last answer I expected to get out of you, and I'm so happy I asked that question. Snoop, uh, Chingy. <laughs> Um, God, there's so many of them. I can't remember them because you've got like 13 cats and five dogs. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> um, no wonder you're losing everything when you're moving. You're just trying to keep track of the animals. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so it goes on every bloody rapper. We, um, we've been waiting for the announcement about the Ronnie James Dio documentary. Have you seen it yet? Yeah, I went to uh, South by Southwest for the um, the premiere, and it, I, I loved it. Can you tell I, me anything about it? I don't know anyone else that's seen it yet. It gets really, uh, I got really emotional, and I was sitting next to Sebastian Back and um, Eddie Trunk at the time, and the three of us were like, <laughs> there was like tears in our eyes, and we were like pretending that we were coughing or something. It gets, it does get really emotional towards the end, and um, especially to me because I was there when he died. Uh, so it, it's really sad, but it's a it's a great documentary. I really loved it. 
They haven't announced when they're going to release it and how they're going to release it so the rest of us can see it. But the reviews have all said the same thing, that it's incredibly emotional. Yeah, I think Wendy was saying um, she's looking at November release. But, uh, you know, I don't know how things like that work out. So are you- I think that's what she's looking at, November. Are you planning on going out on the road? What's what's next once you unpack and find all your right shoes? Oh, I'm too bloody old now. <laughs> I'm going to Italy on a train journey in June. It's I was about- going to ask you, do you travel for fun or do you just want to oh, stay yeah. home because of all the traveling you've done in your career? The COVID thing drove me absolutely nuts because I couldn't even go back to England for two years. Um yeah, after being on the road for 50 years, it's in your blood. It's like if, if I'm at home for two weeks, I start getting really antsy. <laughs> and I have to go anywhere just to get out on the road. Um, but I love trains. So uh, I do this train thing every year. And this year it's going to be Italy. Start in London, go all the way down to uh, Capri. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Well, during COVID, I thought it was a good idea to get married. And you've been married for quite a long time. So as a newlywed, can you give me any marriage advice? (laughs) Um, (laughs) Yeah, don't cheat on him. (laughs) (laughs) The same goes for him too, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay, I just want to make sure it's the same both ways. Yeah, I gave all that up when when we got married, along with drugs. And now it's just an animal farm over there. It certainly is. In <laughs> fact, we were just, me and my wife are going on the safari in uh, October. And she doesn't like to be away from the animals for more than five days. And so we're trying to figure out how we're going to leave it because we're doing the safari and we're doing Egypt, the pyramids and all that, which will last three weeks. And um, we were just now trying to figure out who's going to look after the animals while we're away for three weeks. I'll come and look after them. I'll bring Wednesday with me. I'll keep you to that. You know, I'm not doing anything the way technology is now. I can take my gear with me and do the show from the West Coast. I'm going to tell Gloria to call you after this. Absolutely. I would be honored. Are you kidding to hang around with those legendary rappers? Hell yeah. (laughs) Problem solved then. Problem solved. Have you been on a safari? I've been and it was life changing for me. Yeah, Gloria, I haven't been on. Gloria has. And she's been nagging me to go on well, back to one with her. And uh, her friends go on them every like year or every two years because, you know, we're, they're all in uh, saving animals and all that kind of thing. And the woman over there at the moment just sent us the her videos of the uh, gorillas in Rwanda and the golden monkeys, the called as well. And um, you literally walk walk up on the, walk through the jungle and come across the gorillas. It makes you realize that we're the ones that belong in the cage, observing them as opposed to the other way around. Absolutely. I mean, the way they look after the, the children and everything like that, it's amazing. You know, the, the, it's like pure love. Well, Geezer, thank you so much for spending time with me today. I really appreciate the generosity of your time. And like I said, you're probably the busiest guy in rock and roll right now with all these projects you got going on. Yeah, especially unpacking. I know. I was going to say, never mind trying to find your underwear. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. And uh, tell Gloria, call me anytime and I'll get on a plane with the dog and I'll be right out there house sitting for you. She'll be on the phone as soon as I've hung up. (laughs) Thank you so much. Have a great day. You too. Take care. All right. Bye. Bye. Seriously, Gloria, call me. I will watch all of the rappers while you guys go on safari. There he is, the one and only, the legend, Geezer Butler from Black Sabbath. If you want to check out the video for the new Apocalyptica song, I'll get through it. It's linked in the show notes of this podcast. You'll also find the corresponding playlist for this episode link. There's a corresponding playlist for every full-length episode of the Mysteries Carry podcast, and it is filled 
with Geezer Butler's music and all of the other artists that we talked about in this interview. You'll also find all of Geezer's social media and web links, and you'll find all of mine too. And if you liked what you heard, don't forget to like and follow the Mistress Carrie podcast. New full-length episodes come out every Wednesday. Plus, every weekday, you get the sit rep. The Situation Report is all your rock news, music headlines, and industry info in less than five minutes. You can also watch me live on Cocktails in the War Room at 8.30 Eastern every Tuesday night, live on my official Facebook page. For more info on that and everything else Mistress Carrie, including the official online Mistress Carrie store with our brand new tank tops, you can just head to MistressCarrie.com. The Mistress Carrie Podcast, a proud member of the Pantheon Podcast Network. With one of the best savings rates in America, banking with Capital One is the easiest decision in the history of decisions. Even easier than choosing Slash to be in your band. Next up for lead guitar. You're in. Cool. (laughs) Yep, even easier than that. And with no fees or minimums on checking and savings accounts, is it even a decision? That's banking reimagined. What's in your wallet? Terms apply. See CapitalOne.com slash bank for details. Capital One and a member FDIC.